Welcome to Willard Church of the Nazarene. We're glad you're here. We can't wait to share the service with you.
blessed assurance.
the answer. That's why I trust Him. That's why I trust Him. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. That's why I trust Him. That's why I trust Him. I sought the Lord. Today we're going to be in 2 Samuel 11, 2 Samuel 11. Second Samuel 11, beginning at verse 1. We're continuing our series on the life of David, and today we're looking at one of the most well-known things about David. Unfortunately, it's not the best thing about him, right? It's not a, a good story, but it's a story that we can learn so much from. It's, of course, the story involving Bathsheba, her husband Uriah, and a prophet of God named Nathan. Second Samuel 11, would you stand with me as we honor God's word? In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. Would you go down to verse 14? In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest, then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. And then would you turn to chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord sent Nathan to David. When he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had brought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him. Instead, he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, this man who did this must die. He must pay for the lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then 
Nathan said to David, you are the man. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we pray that it would speak to us, not, not a person behind this pulpit, but your word directly to our hearts in a way that only you can communicate it. Holy Spirit, you have right of way. Do what you need to do. Speak truth to us and help us to have hearts that accept it and align our lives to it. Lord, transform us to look more like you to this world. Lord, we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. In the part of the passage that we read, David was on the roof, right? He saw a beautiful woman, and, the, and, and he finds out who this woman is. It's Uriah the Hittite's wife. That should have been a big red flag. That should have immediately put this woman out of David's mind, but he ignores it and sends for her. He sleeps with her, and she becomes pregnant. Bathsheba's husband, Uriah the Hittite, was a soldier in the army of Israel, right? What we didn't read was that when David realized that Bathsheba was pregnant, he sent for Uriah, and he tries to cover it all up, right? He's hoping that when Uriah comes back, he'll just spend time with his wife and, and know her biblically, right? And then just assume that the kid is his. But Uriah is an honorable man, and he refuses to do that because he has brothers that are in harm's way right now. And because they can't have this luxury, he won't as well. So he refrains from this. David tries to even get him drunk, right? To encourage him to go spend time with his wife, but Uriah still doesn't do it. And because he doesn't, David sends him back with this letter, back to the siege, right? And this letter will end up costing him his life. Now, if you've read the previous account of David while he was on the run, while he was a, a fugitive from Saul, while he was going around, you, you know that there were men that surrounded him, right? Some were great warriors and did amazing military feats. They were known as David's mighty men because of their acts of valor. Uriah the Hittite was one of the 30 that were listed in that group. So this isn't just any random soldier, right? This is, this is a man who David possibly owes his life to because he came alongside him and fought for him, right? This is a brother. David covets his wife, takes her, has this man murdered and covers it all. We can't miss just how horrible this act is. And we need to keep in mind who's committed it, right? This is a man who wrote many beautiful psalms. Psalm 40, verse 8 says this, I desire to do your will, my God. Your law is within my heart. The man who wrote that the man who we've said all through this series, this was a man who had a heart after God's own heart, right? Did this. What, what does that teach us today? It shows us that within us are the seeds of terrible acts, the capability of the worst possible deeds. They live in every human heart, even the best of us, even the ones with Great relationships with God. Could we say that about David? Great relationship with God. Even the best are capable of going down these types of paths. Right? If you look at World War II, most of the British and, and uh, American leaders, including FDR, when they first heard about the Holocaust and the news about what German, Germany was doing, they didn't believe the reports. They couldn't believe the reports. They dismissed them. Later on, FDR at one point admitted that he had not been able to accept the idea that the Germans were capable 
of doing those things. The thought was, how can any civilized country, right, a country in Europe, a nation that gave us Mozart and Bach, how could a nation like that go down this path? How could a people that lived there permit it, go along with it, that genocide? People could understand if it was some uncivilized remote country somewhere, right? That'd be easier to understand, but surely not some modernized civil nation. As Christians, though, we, we know that the seeds like these live in man's heart. We are born with a nature that inclines us to sin, a nature that must be crucified, a nature that must be killed, right? No one is immune to this. If you don't believe that, how many times do we see a pastor fall in the news? Good men, good women of God, and something happens and they end up falling. What do you see in the lives of our biblical heroes, right? Abraham is a man of faith, and he continually lied and tells everyone that his wife is really his sister, and he ends up putting his wife in harm's way time and time again. Jacob deceives and lies all the time. Moses, after he met the Lord, after he encountered the Lord and saw that all he had done right, he ended up being kept from the promised land. Peter spends years with Jesus Christ and ends up telling people, I don't even know this man, right? He called down curses upon himself and distanced himself from Jesus. This account, if this man who had a heart after God's own heart, if he can go down this path, then that's in us as well. And we need to be careful of the seeds that are planted in our lives. Seeds can grow if we're not vigilant. Seeds can grow into trees. And what do trees grow into? Forests, right? That's how seeds work. It starts off as this unguarded conversation, right, that we have with a, a coworker, and it turns more and more intimate over time with what we're talking about. And then there's a, a touch, right? And then there's a meeting, and then there's an affair, and a, a divorce comes from that, and a family is torn in two. If the soil is right, if seeds are watered, seeds can grow into trees, and trees can become forests over time. John Owen, who was a British theologian in the 17th century, said this, Be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. Be killing sin, or sin will be killing you. My friends, we need to look for the seeds in our lives. Have you ever tried to pull out a tree from the ground? Even those small little scrawny things, right? You ever tried to pull one out? They're hard. They're hard to pull out. In fact, most times I haven't been able to. Look for the seeds and smash them before they take root. Don't allow them in your lives, right? Today, can we ask the Holy Spirit right now to reveal to us what seeds are we permitting? What seeds are we allowing in our life? What seeds are we excusing? Oh, it's just something that we watch on TV, right? It's not that bad. What small things are you tolerating? Are you allowing in your life right now? Something on TV? Is it an attitude, right? Is it a little bit of gossip? Do you allow yourself to hold on to unforgiveness? It's a whole lot easier to squash an acorn than bring down an oak tree right? Squash them now. James warns us in chapter 1, verse 14, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. There is a process, a growth process there. And it will drag you, right? 
if you don't cut it off, if you don't smash it right now? What desires are you uh, allowing? What are you putting up with? What are you excusing? Whatever we put up with, what, whatever we allow to grow can grow into something terrible. So be killing sin or sin will be killing you. That's the first thing that I want us to get from this passage that God revealed. The danger of, of seeds, right? The second thing we learn uh, uh, in this account is the shrewdness of of grace, shrewdness, yeah. God sends Nathan the prophet to David, and look how he handles the situation, right? The expectation is that when this prophet comes into David's presence, he's going to call him out. Liar, deceiver, murderer, right? You've sinned. Repent. That's the expectation, but instead... Nathan comes with a case. Comes in and says, I'd like to share a case between a rich man and a poor man. Why does he bring him a case? Why does he bring him a, a story? Well, David was the king, and that's what kings did back then. A, a king would hear cases and make a decision on that case. They would judge over them. They would decide the outcome, right? So David is used to this, and He's prepared and he listens to the case, right? The case was there were two men, one rich, one poor. The rich man had a ton of sheep and cattle, right? But the poor man just had one ewe, one lamb. He raised this lamb. It grew up with his children. It grew up in his household, right? The, the text says he, he raised it like a daughter. Well, this traveler comes to town. Back then, hospitality. Back then, receiving someone was one of the chief virtues of the culture, and you were responsible for those travelers to help them out and take care of them. He was socially obligated to provide for this traveler, right? But instead of taking from his abundance, he took from this poor man the one lamb and had it prepared, right? That was the case that was brought to the king, the king's anger burns, and he pronounces judgment, right? This, this man must pay for this lamb four times over. That was the Mosaic law back then. If you were robbed or you were defrauded, you had to pay back four times as much. But the other thing that David says is this, verse 5, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. That goes beyond the Mosaic Law. That's not written anywhere in there. You wouldn't have taken that that far. There's no death sentence for stealing back in this time period. But David is furious, right? Sometimes when we have a guilty conscience about something, we stand as upright as we can in another area to kind of try and make up for it, to make up for the place that we're failing as king, it was David's obligation to dispense justice, right, and protect his people. But in this affair with Bathsheba and the situation with Uriah, he had done just the opposite. Now he listens to Nathan's tale, and David has this desire to be a champion, a desire to do good, right, because he's just failed, and it comes out in the form of anger towards this rich man, this Man must die. And Nathan knows that when he hears this, right, what David has said, he knows he has him exactly where he wants him. And he replies to him, you are the man. This is an extremely important and relative thing for us to learn today, especially. Notice how Nathan does this, right? Nathan starts off very carefully, very quietly. Let me tell you about this case. Why? Was he, was he scared of David? Did he not want to confront the king? No, we know he, he's not because he does, in fact, confront him, right? So why does he do it this way? It's because as a man of God, he's reflecting the grace of God. You get that? We have to understand this. Grace's goal 
Grace's goal is for conviction and conversion, not condemnation. Can I say that again? Grace's goal is for conviction and conversion, not condemnation. God never denounces somebody in a way that sets that person up for failure. He doesn't act that way, right? What happens when we condemn somebody? What happens every time that we condemn somebody? It always raises defense mechanisms. Walls always come up, right? And it, they are raised so high that they won't listen to anything that we're saying, right? That's at least what I do when people bring that condemnation to me. Listen, it, it brings God glory to, to tell the truth about sin, but it brings God even more glory when that person that you're telling about their sin repents, right? If we condemn a person in such a way that it makes it almost impossible for that person to, to repent, we're just being self-righteous Pharisees. That's who we resemble. John 3.16, the kids, and I forgot to bring the Bible quizzers up here. I'm so sorry. John 3.16 was their memory verse, right? We all know it. Do you know John 3.17? For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, right? But to save the world through him. Nathan is following that model. Jesus didn't come to condemn, but he came to save. Too many of us Christians proclaim truth but we do it with a condemning manner. Realize this. Nobody sins like David without spinning uh, a web of rationalizations and defense mechanisms all around themselves, right? Think of the politician. How many politicians start off with these noble ideas on how they're going to make this country better, right? But year after year, it's frustrating. Things are hard. Lies are told. Being in the public eye takes a, a toll, right? Politicians have to sacrifice when they're in the public eye in that place of leadership. They have to give themselves. If they're good, they're, they'll give themselves and they'll have, to un, they'll have to endure all of this politically driven criticism, right or not right. And when that happens, the acorn of self-pity starts to grow. Poor me, right? Nobody understands the sacrifices that I made with my family and with my time. Nobody knows what I endure, right, with all these lies. And then all of a sudden, there's an opportunity for a bribe. There's an opportunity for an affair. And you know what? I think I deserve that. I think it's okay if I go down this path. I can take that, right? And an acorn takes roots and starts to become a tree, and soon it becomes a forest. After they take the bribe and it comes out, right? Maybe a laptop's discovered. They can't admit it. They can't take it because what would happen if, if we would be removed from political power. The nation would suffer, right? It's better for the nation if we can just kind of cover it up. The scandal would hurt the country. I'm too important. We don't want that other person to be in power, right? The spin machine gets cranked up. What happens when you get confronted with something you've done? If it's come with condemnation, walls come up. Defense mechanisms go in place. Maybe you start swinging back. That's sometimes my first response when somebody comes swinging, right? Has truth ever prevailed in a conversation about politics? Have you ever had a great conversation about politics where you've shared some truth with the other side and they've gone, oh, I never thought I saw it that way. You're, you're right, right? Both ways. Never goes well. No, walls go up. People fight back. But we feel good, right, Christians? We pat ourselves on the back when we 
tell the truth of God's word, even when we do it in a condemning way to that person that's had an abortion instead of a grace-filled way? I told them the truth. I condemned that evil. But hearts get hardened, right? Walls go up. Nathan was a vehicle for the shrewdness of the grace of God. The shrewd grace disarms people, right? Do you want to see people condemned or transformed? What's your real goal about that person on the other political aisle, right? How do you really see them or, or think about them? What about that person that doesn't know Christ? Do you want to see them condemned, realize what a sinner they are, or do you want them to experience the grace of God and be set free and have their lives totally flipped upside down? What's the goal? What's behind your words, right? We have to see that we often wield truth in a condemning manner. And we got to be careful about that. We all need to be Nathans, and we all need to have Nathans in our lives. You have a friend who's doing something wrong. You see him heading down that path, right? Will you be a Nathan and confront them and talk to them with truth and grace, right? Or is it going to be truth and condemnation? How do you tell the difference where you're coming from? Whether or not your truth is accompanied by grace or your truth is accompanied by condemnation, it it happens from your posture, right? If I come alongside somebody and I put my arms around them and say, "I'm, I'm worried about the path that you're on and where you're headed, and I just want you to know Jesus Christ, right? That's grace. When you point the finger at somebody across the aisle and you're not willing to go over there, that's condemnation. Be careful with that. Don't point the finger, right? There's a way of telling truth in a way that really doesn't honor the truth. It's not in accord with the truth. Jesus was the truth, right? The way, the truth, and the life. Sinners had a chance to accept the truth because it came with grace. That's who he was. Grace and truth. Do you remember the woman that's caught in adultery? Caught in the very act of adultery that was brought before him. Do you remember what he said to her? He says this, John 8, verse 10, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. There's the truth. Go now and leave your life of sin. You're you're living in sin, right? There's no doubt about that. But it's accompanied by, I don't condemn you. Right? That needs to be us, Christians. Grace and truth. We've got to present the truth. We can't not stand for the truth. But we've got to do it with grace. If it's condemning, we're Pharisees. That's who we are right? Let's be Nathans, and let's realize that we need some Nathans in our lives, right? Let's, let's give some people some permission to point out when they see us going down the wrong path. Let's encourage people to do that, right? If you see me going down the wrong path, come with grace and share and point it out. Don't come condemn me, right? Because my walls are going to go up. Don't send me an email. I don't do good with emails, right? Face the faith. Come talk to me. Do it with grace. Do it with truth. Let's give some people some permission to point out sin in our lives. Let's give some people to ask us how we're doing with that thing that we struggle with. Right? I'm, I'm struggling with this. I give you permission to ask me about it and to talk to me about it. Right? Sin is deceitful. Sin is deceitful, Hebrews 3.13, but encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Encourage one another, also translated exhort one another. Exhort means to confront. How often are we supposed to confront people? Daily. 
If you're missing the mark, does anybody have permission to confront you? Just don't bring condemnation, right? Walls will go up. Do it with grace. Sin is deceitful. Hearts are hardened, hardened by it, right? Most of our biggest problems, we, we deceive ourselves. We can't see it. It's there. But we need a Nathan in our life to confront us. Do you have friends like that? Let me, let me tell you this thing too, all right? This Nathan type of stuff does not happen over Facebook. It doesn't. It never works over Facebook, right? I see stuff on there. There's a, a lot of truth. There's a lot of confronting. But it's usually in a condemning manner, right? This stuff works best face-to-face. So take that opportunity, right? Are you, are you standing next to somebody or are you standing across from somebody pointing the finger? We didn't read this, but in 2 Samuel 12, verse 13, it says this, Then David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, The Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. This, this is the third thing that we need to get. The last few weeks I've been hitting grace pretty hard, if you've noticed. David repented. And, and we're not going to look at his act of repentance in, in great detail. If you want to look at that, read Psalm 51. In fact, if you're struggling with sin, read Psalm 51. It's a great passage of Scripture, right? He wrote that after he had been confronted by Nathan, after he had repented. That was his prayer. That was his thought process, right? But what I want us to see is not what David said, but what God said. The Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. David knew rightly. Do you remember what he proclaimed? about the man, the man deserved to die. But God took away his sin. I want you to think about that for a second, right? It's not just that David committed adultery, committed murder, right, which he did, but he also brought other people in on it. A commander had to wrestle with this horrible order to have somebody killed, right? The commander has to put a bunch of men in harm's way and and put him in jeopardy to attack a place that he probably knew that he shouldn't just to get this man killed. And others died as a result. The sin of David brought other people into it and spread, right? There's, There's more blood on David's hands than just Uriah. That's what I want us to realize, right? Other loyal soldiers, loyal brothers, ended up dying. And David is responsible. And yet, God comes, right, and says through Nathan, I've taken away your sins. You won't die. It's not fair. But it's grace. Right? We can complain about it. It's not fair for God to forgive this horrible act. But can we remember where grace comes from? There's a remarkable resemblance of this story of David standing before Nathan to that of Jesus standing before Pilate, right? Nathan says of David, you are the man, right? And Pilate says of Jesus, behold the man right? There's two courtrooms. There's two men on trial here, right? With David, the man who sits as a judge, should be in the accused seat. In Pilate's courtroom, it's the other way around. The man who is accused is the judge of the world, right? With, with David, God sends a prophet to rectify the situation. In comes Nathan. You are the man. And suddenly, the man who sits as a judge is put in his proper place as the accused. And he repents, and he finds forgiveness, right? But in Pilate's courtroom, nobody comes in. Nobody makes it right. No prophet shows up and says to Pilate, says to the Pharisees, you are the men, right? That doesn't happen. On the cross, still no one shows up, right? The Father turns his back 
on his son. And Jesus dies forsaken. The righteous judge of all the earth who did nothing wrong dies condemned. Why? So that we who are all David's, when we repent, we can receive forgiveness. The condemnation that brought him death brings us life. Amen? The condemnation that brought him death brings us life. There's no place for condemnation with us Christians. He received it all. We don't need to spew it on anybody else. We don't need to spew shame on everybody else. We need to offer grace. We need to offer truth. Hey, you're on your way to hell if you don't give your life to Jesus Christ, right? But that's what's available for you. And I'll stand by you. And I'll help you walk this road. Amen? Amen. Stand with me. Can we be reminded that we don't atone for our sins? There is nothing good that we can do that will ever atone for our sins. We just repent and access through repentance God's grace. Through faith in Jesus Christ and what he did, we access grace. And when we do that, there's no condemnation. Amen? No condemnation. I get to live without that, right? We're not earning our salvation. We're accessing it. Some of you, some of us, have done some really bad things, right? And sometimes we struggle to forgive ourselves. This account is pretty bad, right? I think we all see that. But don't miss the pardon. Amen? Don't miss God's grace. Some of you need to accept that. Listen, the goal of grace, right, is conviction. But it's also transformation, right? It's conversion, not con- condemnation. Quit condemning yourself. Live in the freedom that is offered. Live a life of gratitude to what's been done for you. Make that the desire of your heart. That's what I want to do. I'm never going to earn it. I just want to live in gratitude for it. Will you do that? Live in a way that honors him by sharing it with somebody. Make it your goal in life if you've never done it. Make it your goal this year to share the good news with somebody. Hey, I was on the way to death and damnation, but I encountered the risen king, the Lord, who died on a cross for me, who was resurrected and called me to follow him called me when I was a sinner, when I was his enemy, when I wasn't good, right? He called me to follow him, and I've done that, and I've accepted that, and he's flipped my life upside down. And you can too. You can find it in your life. Share that with somebody. Share your testimony of what you've done. Will you remember those three things? Listen, quit playing around. Knock it off. What seeds are in your life that you're permitting? They will drag you to hell, pure and simple. They will drag you to death, right? Stomp them out. Don't play any games. Accept God's grace. Live in that, right? And then share the truth, but do it with grace. Don't do it with condemnation when you're talking to people. Come alongside them. Love them, even when they're your enemy, even when they're across the aisle politically, right, and you can't stand them. Come alongside them. Hey, they're an enemy now, but one day hopefully they're a brother or sister. Right? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for your grace. Lord, let us live lives in response to that. Give us opportunities to share the grace that's been given to us with other people. Lord, you tell us that you give us the ministry of reconciliation. We can see people reconciled to you.
Lord. That is what we enjoyed at one time in the garden, a face-to-face relationship with you. But we rejected that. We rejected you. But you came, and you died, and you made a way so that we could be reconciled with you, so that our relationship could be restored with you. Father, would you put somebody in our path that we can share that good news with? Lord, we love you, and we give you all praise and honor. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you.